بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما Last week we spoke about the army of the Muslims and the army of the Quraysh coming face to face and it was almost time for the battle of Badr to begin and as we mentioned the caravan of Abu Sufyan it was able to escape being ambushed by the Muslims by taking another route behind the mountains close to the Red Sea now the whole reason why the Kuffar army came out in the first place was to save that caravan was to save the caravan that Abu Sufyan was bringing back to Mecca but now that Abu Sufyan was able to evade the Muslims from ambushing that caravan that whole purpose wasn't there anymore and Abu Sufyan came to know through intelligence that the army of the Kuffar of the Quraysh had actually come out and he was able to send a message to them that the caravan has been diverted the danger on the caravan is gone and there is no need for any protection for this caravan anymore Abu Sufyan gave them the message that he was successfully able to evade the Muslims so now the Kuffar they were thinking what should we do now the whole reason why we came out here in the first place was to protect this caravan of Abu Sufyan but now Abu Sufyan has informed us has got the message to us that his caravan is safe so what's what's the purpose of even fighting now the whole reason we came to fight was to get that caravan now that the caravan is not even in danger anymore there's no purpose for us to continue this fight why do we even need to fight with the Muslims so they started discussing a possible retreat they started discussing even before the fighting began they thought about and they actually discussed amongst each other leaving and going back towards Mecca because the whole purpose was gone the whole purpose that they came out for in the, per in the first place it wasn't there anymore now of course Abu Jahl he didn't want to hear any of this Abu Jahl his main purpose was not the caravan his main purpose was he wanted to destroy Islam and he wanted to annihilate the Muslims whether there was a caravan to save or no caravan to save he really didn't care so much about that that was only of secondary importance to him what he really wanted to do was annihilate the Muslims and destroy Islam but the other members of the Quraysh they weren't thinking like that they were thinking that we came out here to save our caravan there is no need for us to do that anymore our caravan is safe so we might as well go back home and actually some of the kuffar of the Quraysh they actually retreated and they went back home for example Al-Akhnas Ibn Shuraiq and his people Bani Zuhra they retreated and they went back to Mecca also some members of Bani Hashim which was actually the tribe of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself some members of Bani Hashim they went back as well and the only reason why Bani Hashim even came out in the first place they didn't even want to come out but the reason why they came was so that the Kuffar wouldn't criticize them if they had stayed in Mecca then the rest of the Quraysh would say look at Bani Hashim the Quraysh was under attack and they just stayed sitting at home in Mecca so to avoid that type of criticism and to avoid their reputation taking a hit they went out even though they didn't want to go so now that the whole purpose of the trip was defeated that they didn't really need to go anymore because the caravan was safe many members of Bani Hashim they saw this as a good opportunity to go back they didn't even want to come in the first place now they saw this as a good opportunity look we're going back to Mecca so some of them went back but some of Bani Hashim stayed because they knew that if all of them went back then the Quraysh would use that against them they would criticize them they would call them cowards they would call them names and it would hurt their reputation so some members of Bani Hashim went back but some of them stayed and amongst those who stayed 
was Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet. And at that time, Al Abbas had not accepted Islam yet. He was still with the Mushrikeen. So he stayed. He didn't retreat, he didn't go back to Mecca. But other members of the Quraysh were still discussing it. Should we stay? Should we go back? Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, one of the heads of the Kuffar of the Quraysh, one of the most powerful men of the Quraysh. He said, there's no point in doing this anymore. I'm going back. And Abu Jahl said, oh, you're going back. You're just looking for an excuse not to fight, you coward. And then when he was called a coward, Utbah, you know, this was the way of the Arabs. Their pride was the most important thing to them. So they couldn't handle being called a coward and they couldn't handle being compared to women, they couldn't handle this type of criticism. It was a hit on their ego and a hit on their pride. So when Abu Jahl called him a coward and said, you're just looking for an excuse to go back because you don't want to fight, because you're scared, he said, no, no, okay, I'm staying. So Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, he stayed. Other members of the Quraysh, they were hesitating. They were thinking, should we stay? Should we come back? And Abu Jahl saw this as something that would mess up his whole plan. His plan was for the Quraysh to be united and to go and fight and annihilate the Muslim army. So when he saw this type of hesitation, when he saw many members of the Quraysh willing to go back to Mecca because the caravan was safe and there was no danger for the caravan anymore, he knew he needed to do something very drastic to make sure that everyone stays and everyone fights. So he went to Amir, Ibn al-Hadrami and Amr ibn al-Hadrami was the father of Amr ibn al-Hadrami and if you remember a couple of weeks ago we spoke about Amr ibn al-Hadrami we spoke about the Sariya or the expedition that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent under the command of Abdullah ibn Jahsh near Mecca and there was the small caravan and that small group of Muslims they ambushed that caravan and they killed one of the kuffar of the Quraysh who was with that caravan. And the name of that kafir, his name was Amr ibn al-Hadrami. So his father was Amir ibn al-Hadrami. And he was there at Badr. So Abu Jahl goes to him and he says, look, now you're going to get a chance to get revenge for the death of your son. And Amr said, yes, when we start fighting, we will get revenge for the death of Amr. We'll get revenge for the death of my son. Then Abu Jahl said, but didn't you hear, Ya Amr? Didn't you hear that the Quraysh, they're talking about going back to Mecca? They don't even want to fight anymore because the caravan is safe. So, you know, they don't really care about your son. They were only concerned about that caravan. Now that their caravan is safe, their merchandise is safe, their wealth is safe, they want to go back to Mecca. They don't care about your son. Now Amir, he was very upset about this. He was like, they don't care about my son. They don't want to go and get revenge for my son. He said, no, you need to talk to them. So Amir, he shouts out to the Quraysh. He says, Ya Quraysh, wa walada, wa amra. He says, what about my son? What about Amr? You have to help me take revenge for the death of my son. Again, he played into the honor of these people, the pride of these people. And he said, Amir, he said, Wallahi, if it was one of your sons, he's speaking to the VIPs of the Quraysh, if it was one of your sons, you would never leave and go back to Mecca. You would fight, but because it's my son, you don't care. What type of kinship is this? What type of brotherhood is this? What type of honor do you people have? So when they talk about honor and they talk about pride and they talk about nobility, this is something that the Quraysh, they can't take. So they said, okay, okay, we will help you and we will take revenge for the death of your son. So due to this, the Quraysh, they decided to stay and they did not retreat back to Mecca. So now after this, after it has been decided that they are going to fight, both sides are ready and they are face to face. And the Prophet wasallam he prepares his side for battle. He gives the flags of the Muslim army, two flags. He gives one to Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu anhu. 
and he gives the other one to Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Both very brave men, very brave fighters in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now before the fighting actually started, from the kuffar side, Abu Jahl actually made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Jahl, he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from his dua, he said, Allahum mansur khayr ad -deenain. He said, Ya Allah, allow the better of these two religions to have victory in this battle. The religion of the Quraysh, which is the old religion of this tribe, or the new religion of Muhammad. Ya Allah, give victory to the better of the two religions. And he was thinking, Abu Jahl, that his religion, the religion of shirk and kufr, was the better religion. So he actually made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, give victory to the better of these two religions. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually accepted and granted that dua of Abu Jahl. This dua of Abu Jahl actually it turned out to be against himself. He made dua against himself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered that dua. Of course, we know that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for victory and the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِذْ تَسْتَغِيثُونَ رَبَّكُمْ فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Anfal, when you asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you asked your Lord to save you, to give you victory, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ And He answered you, أَنِّي مُمِدُّكُمْ بِأَلْفٍ مِّنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ مُرْدِفِينَ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he provided 1,000 angels to come and fight alongside the Muslims. So after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made this dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was very happy. You could see the effects of happiness on the face of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he informed the Muslims that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down the angels. He sent down Jibreel alayhi salam on a horse with armor. And he sent down 1,000 angels along with Jibreel alayhi salam to fight alongside the Muslims. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he could see those angels. Even though the Sahaba, they couldn't see them. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he could see them. And he told his companions that the angels are here. The angels are here and they are going to fight alongside you. So this was something that gave happiness to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and happiness to the companions as well. And it's very significant because the angels, they never fought in any other battle except for the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr is the only battle where angels actually fought alongside the Muslims. The angels did come down on the day of Hunayn as well, but they didn't fight. But on the day of Badr, they actually fought. And that's something that gives the Battle of Badr a special significance and a special importance over other battles. So... Alongside the kuffar was Iblis himself. Alongside the army of the kuffar of the Quraysh, Iblis, the shaitan, he was there himself. And he took the human form of Suraqa ibn Malik. As we mentioned last week, he took the form of Suraqa ibn Malik to convince, sorry, to convince the kuffar to actually leave Mecca. They were afraid to leave Mecca because they, th they thought that the people of Kinana would come and take over Mecca. But the shaitan came in the form of Suraqa ibn Malik and said, don't worry, I guarantee that the tribe of Kinana will not take over Mecca. And then they left and they went towards Badr. Now, Iblis, he's at Badr with the kuffar and he's in the form of Suraqa ibn Malik and he is able to see the angels. So Iblis in the form of Suraqa ibn Malik, he's with these kuffar and he's able to see the angels as well. The angels are here to fight. And when he sees the angels, he starts running away. The humans, they don't see the angels, but the shaitan, he was able to see. And he starts running away. So one of the kuffar of the Quraysh, when he saw him running away, he took his hand. He said, hey, where are you running? Remember, you promised that you're going to protect us and you're going to help us. Where are you running to now? Where are you running? And this man thought that this is Suraqa ibn Malik, when in actuality it was not. It was Iblis, it was the shaitan himself. So the shaitan pushed this man down to the ground and he said, Inni ara ma la tarawn, inni Allah. He said, I see that which you don't see. I fear Allah. And he ran and he ran and he ran away. He abandoned and he deserted the battlefield. 
and he went all the way into the Red Sea actually and then the shaitan Iblis himself he started making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Rabbi wa'adaka alladhi wa'adtani Oh my Lord you promised me with a promise Ya, ya Allah keep your promise to me and what was the promise that Allah made to the shaitan when the shaitan was expelled from Jannah he said Rabbi anzirni ila yawmi yuba'athun he said Oh Allah, oh my Lord, give me, give me respite, give me life until the day of resurrection. And then Allah answered that dua, قَالَ إِنَّكَ مِنَ الْمُنْظَرِينَ You are from those who have been given respite. Okay, you can have life until يوم القيامة. So Allah gave this request to the shaitan. Now the shaitan, he is seeing angels ready to fight, physically fight. This is something Iblis has never seen before. He has never seen angels come down to earth to actually fight and kill people. So he thought this is the end for him. He thought this is the day that he is going to be killed as well. So he ran away and he started making dua to Allah. Ya Allah, you promised me that you're going to give me life until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. He was afraid that that was his last day. He was afraid that he was actually going to be killed by those angels because it's something that he had never seen before in his life. So now the liter literally the armies, the army of the Muslims and the army of the Kuffar, they're face to face and the fighting is about to begin. Before the fighting begins, the Prophet wasallam he picks up some dust and he throws it at the Kuffar. And the Kuffar, they all start rubbing their eyes. It really has a serious effect on them. The Prophet ﷺ just throws some dust. It seems like a simple thing, but it really severely affected them. So they're all rubbing their eyes. And the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Shahatil wujuh, may your faces be disfigured. And this is right before the fighting was about to begin. So they're face to face. The Kuffar army on one side, the Muslim army on the other side. And as we spoke about last week, the Muslims, they had control of all of the water. The Kufar, they didn't have any water. And that was from the strategies of the Muslims, that they were able to take control of all of the wells and they had all of the water on their side. So they had collected the water from the wells and they had made like, they had made like a reservoir of water so that they could drink whenever they needed to drink. Now the Kufar, they're thirsty, they don't have any water and they know that the Muslims, they have this reservoir of water on their side. So one of the Kufar, by the name of Al Aswad ibn Abdul Asad. Al Aswad ibn Abdul Asad, he sees that water and he says, Wallahi, I am going to go and drink from the water on their side, or I will destroy their reservoir, or I will die trying. Three things. I will do one of these three things. Either I will go and drink that water, or I will destroy that reservoir of their water, or I will be killed trying to do this. So he went forward and he tried to infiltrate the Muslim side. And Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhu, he struck him with his sword on his legs until his legs actually were sliced off from his body and he fell down. But he still tried to go towards that reservoir to get water. And when he was near it, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib struck him again with his sword and he killed him. So Al Aswad ibn Abdul Asad, he was the first casualty, he was the first death from the army of the Kuffar. After that, it was time for the Mubaraza. And the way that the armies used to fight in those days is that before the actual fighting, before the actual confrontation, full-blown confrontation would begin with both of the armies, they would select a few people from one side and a few people from the other side while everyone else stays back and those people would fight individually like three from one side come forward and three from the other side come forward and fight three on three while everyone else watches from the back and this was their way for both sides to show their ability to show their courage to show their fighting skills so this is the way that they used to do it they would have uh, what they called mubaraza first so three people from one side, three people from the other side, one-on-one -on -one fights while everyone else watches from the back from both sides. And after the fighting was done, whoever kills whoever, 
they were allowed to take the bodies back to their sides. So the Kuffar sent three of their men. They sent Utbah ibn Rabi'ah and Shayba ibn Rabi'ah and Walid ibn Utbah. So three people from the same family, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah and Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, they're brothers. And Walid ibn Utbah is the son of Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. So Utbah and his son and Shayba, who was the brother of Utbah. So those were the three from the Quraysh who went forward. And they were from the VIPs of the Quraysh. They were from the leaders of the Quraysh. So they said, Ya Muhammad, send three people. Send three of our peers to fight us. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sent Awf ibn al-Harith and Mu'awwad ibn al-Harith and Abdullah ibn Ruwaha. And all of these three were from the Ansar. They were not from the Quraysh. So they're wearing armor, so they can't really recognize who they are. So these three, they come forward. So these Kuffar, Utbah and Shayba and Walid, they ask, who are you? Who are you three? And they identify themselves. They say, we are Awf and Mu'awwad and Abdullah. And then these three Kuffar from the Quraysh, Utbah and Shayba and Walid said, okay, you are honorable people from an honorable tribe, but we don't want to fight you. We want to fight our people. We want to fight our peers. So they go back and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam instead he sends Ubaidah ibn al-Harith ibn Abdul Muttalib. Ubaidah is the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he sends Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. And he sends Ali ibn Abi Talib. Three from the Muhajireen, from the Quraysh, from the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is something that teaches us a lesson as well. Now these days, when people fight, the leaders, they never want to send their family into the battle. They want to protect their families. But look at the Prophet ﷺ leading by example. He's sending his closest relatives outside in the battle to fight face to face with these kuffar. Ubaidah ibn al-Harith and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhum ajma'in. So they go forward. And of course, again, they're wearing armor, so they are not recognizable. So the kuffar, they ask them, who are you? And they, they identify themselves. We are Ubaidah and Hamza and Ali. Then the kuffar, they're satisfied. They say, yes, you are our peers. You are the ones that we want to fight. So now the fight starts, each one one-on-one. -on -one. So Ubaidah ibn al-Harith, he took on Utbah ibn Rabi'ah and Hamza Ibn Abdul Muttalib, he took on Shayba Ibn Rabi'ah. And Ali Ibn Abi Talib, he took Walid Ibn Utbah. Now Hamza was able to kill Shayba almost instantly. And Ali radiallahu an, he was able to kill Walid again almost instantly. They were very skilled. Hamza radiallahu an and Ali radiallahu an, they were from the best fighters. So they were able to take care of those two very simply, very easily and very quickly. But Ubaidah, Ibn al-Harith and Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, they actually got into a prolonged fighting. It was difficult for either side to get to the other side. So both of them actually struck each other. Both of them had injuries and they both fell to the ground. So when Hamza was finished with Shayba and Ali was finished with Walid, then they went to help Ubaidah and they killed Utbah ibn Rabi'ah as well. And then they took Ubaidah back into the Muslim line. And the Kuffar, they took their three dead bodies back into their line. So it was three casualties for the Kuffar and zero casualties for the Muslims. So this is something, and both sides witnessed this. And it was a big uh, moral victory for the Muslims as well. And it was a big moral defeat for the ego of the Quraysh to see that all three of their fighters that they had sent out in this Mubaraza, in this display of fighting, all of them were killed. So it was a big hit for the Kuffar for this to be witnessed by everyone. It was a big hit on their ego. So now Abu Jahl, who is the leader of the army of the Kuffar, he says, okay, no more Mubaraza. Usually they would do more than one Mubaraza. Mubaraza, then another Mubaraza, then another Mubaraza, you know, to have this display of fighting. But when he saw the effects of the first Mubaraza that all three of his men were killed, 
and all of the three Muslims survived, he said, okay, we don't need to do this anymore. We will go on now to the full-blown battle. So they started shooting arrows. And the first Muslim who was hit by an arrow was Mihja, who was a freed slave of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. So he was the first Muslim casualty in Badr radiallahu anhu. So both sides are, are shooting arrows at each other. And the arrows are coming into the sky, going in both directions. So Haritha ibn Suraqa radiallahu anhu, one of the Muslims, he was hit by an arrow. And he died as well. He was one of the early casualties of the Battle of Badr. Later on, when the Prophet ﷺ returned to Medina, the mother of Haritha, she was very sad. You know, she lost her son in this battle and she didn't know. She said he was hit. My son was hit by an, an unknown arrow. We don't even know who hit him. Was it even from the Kuffar side or was it an accidental hit from the Muslim side? My son was hit by an unknown arrow. Ya Rasulullah. If he is in Jannah, if he is in Jannah, then I will be patient. But if he is somewhere else, if he's not in Jannah, then Allah will see what I do. I will cry and I will scream and I will rip my clothes. And then the Prophet said, Ya Um Haritha, Ahabilti? O Um Haritha, what are you talking about? Have you gone mad? A Jannatun Wahida here? Is it one Jannah? Is it only one Jannah? إِنَّهَا جِنَانٌ كَثِيرًا وَإِنَّ بَنَكِ أَصَابَ الْفِرْدَوْسَ الْأَعْلَى The Prophet ﷺ said, it's not just one Jannah, Ya Um Haritha. There are many Jannahs, there are many levels of Jannah. And your son, he has reached, he has attained the highest level, الفردوس الأعلى. So she was very happy to hear this and she said, La ilaha illallah. And she was happy to know that even though her son had died, that he had reached the highest level. He had reached Al-Jannah, Jannat Al-Firdaus. As the fighting started to get intense, both sides are engaging each other. The Prophet Sallallahu he is encouraging the Muslims, go and fight in the way of Allah. And if you fight, and if you don't turn back, and you fight for Allah, and if you are killed, then you will have Jannah. Arduha samawatu wal ard. قُومُوا إِلَىٰ جَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ Stand up and go and fight for a Jannah that is as wide as the heavens and the earth. A huge Jannah. So one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, Umair ibn al-Humam رضي الله عنه He said, Ya Rasulullah, can you say that again? What you just said? And the Prophet ﷺ said, قُومُوا إِلَىٰ جَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ if you die in the way of Allah, if you fight and you are killed, then you will have this Jannah. That, that's wideness, that's width, is like the heavens and the earth. And then Umair ibn al-Humam, he says, Ya Rasulullah, is that, it's that simple? All I have to do is go and fight and if I'm killed, I just have to be killed. And then I will go and I will have that Jannah. And the Prophet wasallam said, yes, that's it. Ya Rasulullah, it's just that simple. I just have to go and fight and be killed and I get the Jannah. He's amazed at this, that it's so simple, so easy. The Prophet ﷺ said, yes, that's it. At that time, Umair, he was eating some dates. He had some dates and he was eating them. And then he said, Wallahi, if I just take the time to finish these dates, that's too long of a life. That's too long to live. And he threw the dates. And he went and fought. And he fought and fought and fought until he was killed. This was the desire that these people had for the reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are some of the amazing incidents that happened on that day, on the day of Badr. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave some very important instructions on the day of Badr regarding the fighting. He said regarding a few people, if you see these certain people, do not kill them. If you see Abu al-Bukhtari ibn Hisham, and he was one of the leaders of the kuffar of the Quraysh. But the Prophet ﷺ said, If you see Abu al-Bukhturi ibn Hisham, do not kill him. If you see anyone from Bani Hashim, do not kill them. Because they didn't even want to come out here in the first place. They were forced to come out. If you see Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, do not kill him. 
So the Prophet ﷺ gave these instructions. Don't kill Abu al-Bukhtari ibn Hisham. Don't kill anyone from Bani, Bani Hashim. And specifically, don't kill Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, because they didn't even want to come out in the first place. But as for Abu al-Bukhtari ibn Hisham, he was not from Bani Hashim. And he came out to fight with his own free will. So why did the Prophet ﷺ say, if you see him, don't kill him? Abu al-Bukhtari ibn Hisham. If you remember, many weeks ago, we spoke about the boycott of the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims in Mecca. Remember the kuffar under the leadership of, leadership of Abu Jahl, they made a contract that the Prophet ﷺ and his family, they would be boycotted. They would be, there would be no business with them. There would be no buying and selling from them. And the Muslims, they suffered because of that boycott for a number of years. And Abu al-Bukhtari ibn Hisham, he didn't like this. And due to his efforts, this boycott ended. Even though he wasn't a Muslim, he knew that this was wrong. He said, we cannot do this. We cannot boycott them. We cannot let them starve like that. This is wrong. This is not a noble thing to do. So Abu al-Bukhtari ibn Hisham, he is the one who actually rallied the Quraysh to end this boycott that Abu Jahl had started. He was responsible for that, for ending that boycott even though he wasn't a Muslim. So the Prophet wasallam, out of his appreciation for that and out of his loyalty for that, he said to his people, if you see Abu al-Bukhtari ibn Hisham, do not kill him. Subhanallah. Look at this, this loyalty of the Prophet wasallam, and look at the nobility of the Messenger of Allah wasallam. When Abu Hudayfa ibn Utbah ibn Rabi'ah heard these instructions that had come from the Prophet wasallam. Now, who is Abu Hudayfa? Abu Hudayfa is one of the sons of Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. Remember those three people who just got killed in the Mubarazah? Who are they? Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, and Walid ibn Utbah. And they were all kuffar. But there was someone from the same family who had accepted Islam and he was fighting on the Muslim side. And he was Abu Hudayfa ibn Utbah. So what just happened a few minutes ago? His father was killed. His uncle was killed and his brother was killed. Three of his closest family members were just killed in front of him. His father, his brother and his uncle. And the Prophet ﷺ gave instructions that do not kill anyone from Bani Hashim and do not kill Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. And Bani Hashim and Al-Abbas are the family of the Prophet ﷺ. So Abu Hudayfa, out of his emotions, he said that we have to kill our own fathers and our uncles and our, and our brothers. We are killing our own family. But we are being ordered not to kill Bani Hashim and Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Wallahi, if I see Al-Abbas, I will kill him. And Wallahi, if I see anyone from Bani Hashim, I will kill them. He said this out of his, his emotions. He had just witnessed the death of some close members of his family. So when Umar ibn al-Khattab when he heard that Abu Hudayfa said this, he went to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, Ya Rasulullah, give me permission to cut the neck of Abu Hudayfa. You gave orders and he wants to disobey your orders? And then Rasulullah said, leave it Ya, ya Umar, relax Ya Umar. Now, the Prophet وسلم, understood that you know, he just witnessed something that had a deep emotional effect on him. And he knew he didn't mean anything bad by it. The Prophet ﷺ was very merciful and compassionate towards his companions. He understood that Abu Hudayfa's emotions just got the better of him. And this is why he said this. So he said, relax, Ya Umar. It's understandable what his feelings are. And then a little, after just a short time, Abu Hudayfa himself, he realized that what he said was not right. And he went himself to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Forgive me, I apologize. I, should not, I don't know what I was thinking when I said that. It was wrong for me to say that and I should not have said it. Ya Rasulullah, Rasul please excuse me, please forgive me. And the Prophet wasallam accepted that apology. So now Abu Hudayfa, he said that for the rest of his life, for the rest of his life, he regretted what he had said on that day. And he said, I would pray extra prayers, I would give extra charity, I would do all of these extra acts of ibadah in order to make up for what I said on that day. 
So it always bothered him and he always felt the guilt that he spoke out of his emotions without thinking about what he was saying. So th th this is real Iman. You know, when someone makes a mistake, they feel that regret and they feel that guilt. So he felt that for the rest of his life. So now the full confrontation is in force. And both sides are heavily fighting with each other. During the fighting, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ by the name of Al-Mujaddir, he saw Abu al-Bukhtari ibn Hisham, the one that the Prophet ﷺ said, if you see him, don't kill him. So he saw him and he made sure that he avoided him and he fought with someone else who was next to him. But Abu al-Bukhtari kept getting in the way to defend his friend, to defend his companion. And Al-Mujaddir kept trying to avoid him, but Abu al-Bukhtari kept getting in the way. And Al-Mujaddir said, Ya Abu al-Bukhtari, leave me alone. I'm not trying to fight you. I don't want to kill you. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he gave us instructions not to kill you. So just let, leave me alone and let me kill this other guy. Don't get involved. And Abu al-Bukhtari said, how can I leave my companions? This is something that is not honorable. I have to defend my people. So he kept in the way. And he went after Al-Mujaddir. Abu, Abu al-Bukhtari, he started trying to hit Al-Mujaddir with his sword. So now Al-Mujaddir, to, to defend himself, to save himself, he had no other option but to fight back. And he ended up killing Abu al-Bukhtari. He didn't mean to do it, but to save his own life, to defend himself, he had to do it. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I know you gave instructions not to kill him, but there was nothing else I could do. He was trying to kill me and I had to fight back. I had to defend myself, so I killed him, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, that's understandable. And he excused him for doing that as well. There was also one of the men from the army of the Kuffar. He was a man named Ubaidah ibn Sa'id ibn al-As. And this man, Ubaidah ibn Sa'id ibn al-As, he was the most heavily armored person of the whole Quraysh. He had armor on him from head to toe. There was nowhere on his body that was free from armor. He was very scared. So he had armor, body armor all over his body. The only place that there was no body armor was his eye. Because he had to see through his eye. If he had armor on his eye, then it's like he's blind. How can he fight? So the only opening was his eyes. So this man was able to inflict some casualties on the Muslims. He was able to hurt a lot of Muslims and the Muslims were not able to do anything to him because of this heavy armor that he had. So they were staying away from him because they knew that, you know, he's very heavily armored and there's nothing really we can do about it. So they were staying away from him. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, who will fight him? Who will fight this man? And nobody came forward. The Prophet ﷺ asked again, who is going to fight him? Who will fight Ubaidah? Ibn Sa'id ibn al-As and nobody answered and the third time he said who will fight Ubaidah ibn Sa'id ibn al-As and finally as Zubair as Zubair ibn al-Awam radiallahu anhu one of the young companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said I will do it I will do it ya Rasulullah and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said okay you go ahead and do it and if there was no one to do it if you didn't come forward and say you would do it I would have gone and done it myself sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so as Zubair ibn al-Awam radiallahu anhu, he took this responsibility and he observed the man and he, he thought about how he should go about this. He's, he's armored from head to toe. There is no opening except in his eyes. So he looked for a long time and he observed and he decided that the only way I can, I can kill this guy is by hitting him in the eye. I, hit, I have to hit him with an arrow in the eye and that will, that will go into his head and kill him. So he aimed very carefully and when he got a good look and a good shot he shot his arrow and he was able to hit him right in the eye and the arrow went into his eye and came out from the back of his head so as Zubair ibn Awam radiallahu an was able to kill Ubaidah ibn Sa'id ibn Al-As also in the battle of Badr some of the amazing things that happened between families sometimes there was a father on the side of the Muslims and a son on the side of the kuffar. Sometimes it was a son on the side of the Muslims and their father was on the side of the kuffar. So close family members fighting with one another. Abu Bakr radiallahu an fighting with the Muslim army and his son Abdul Rahman ibn Abu Bakr. He was not a Muslim at that time and he was fighting on the side of the kuffar. 
So Abu Bakr actually went forward to kill his own son. And Abdul Rahman, he owed some money to Abu Bakr. He had taken some money from his father. So Abu Bakr, he goes close to him. He tries to get close to him. And he says to his own son, he says, Aina mali ya khabith. Imagine. Abu Bakr is saying to his own son, where's my money, you, you piece of scum? And Abdul Rahman, he doesn't want to fight with his father. So he actually ran away. Abu Bakr was going to kill him, but he ran away before his father could actually strike him with his sword. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu an, he killed his uncle, Al-Asi ibn Hisham. Abu Ubaidah al-Jarrah radiallahu an, he killed his father. So none of these blood relations mean anything. When it's a fight between Islam and Kufr, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "لا تجد قوما يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله ولو كانوا آباءهم أو أبناءهم أو إخوانهم أو عشيرتهم." That you will never find the people who believe in Allah and the last day being close to or having love for those who go against Allah and His Messenger, even. If they are their fathers or their sons or their brothers, doesn't matter. The ties of Islam are stronger than the ties of blood. So yes, it was family member against family member and they were willing to kill their family members if they were enemies to Allah and His Messenger. Now of course, as we know, Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, who is known as Asadullah wa Asadu Rasulih, the Lion of Allah and the Lion of the Messenger of Allah. He was one of the greatest fighters of all time. So he was able to inflict very heavy casualties on the army of the Kuffar. Killing people to the right, killing them to the left, in the front, in the back. And nobody was able to do anything to him. So he inflicted very heavy casualties on the army of the Kuffar as well. As Zubair ibn al-Awam radiallahu anhu, we just mentioned the man who killed Ubaidah, the man who killed Ubaidah ibn Sa'id ibn al-As. He was very good with his sword as well. Later on, many years later, his children were asked, how do you know the sword of your father? How do you recognize the sword of your father as Zubair? And his children said, we know the sword of our father because it is bent. It's not straight. Because of how many people he struck with that sword, the sword actually has, has, a, has been bent. It has a curve on it due to the amount of people he has struck with it. So you see the bravery and you see the courage that these people had. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas radiallahu anhu, one of the great companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he was an expert in throwing arrows. He was an expert in throwing arrows. So he would make dua. Before he would throw his arrows, he would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma zalzil aqdamahum. Allahumma ar'ib qulubahum. Oh Allah, make the earth shake under the feet of the kuffar. Oh Allah, strike terror into the hearts of the kuffar. And he would throw his arrows. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was nearby him. And when he would hear these duas of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, he would say, Ameen. And he would say, Allahumma stajib li Sa'ad. Oh Allah, answer the dua of Sa'ad. Oh Allah, answer the dua of Sa'ad. The Prophet ﷺ asked Allah to answer the dua of Sa'ad. So the dua of Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was mustajab. Not only in Badr, but throughout the rest of his life. Any dua that Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas would make, it would be answered. He was known for that. Any dua that he would make, it would be answered in front of the eyes of the people. There was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ by the name of Qatada radiallahu an, And he fought bravely but he was hit in his eye and the eye actually fell out of the socket. It didn't completely fall out, but it was hanging very, very lightly just by a small piece of skin. And it was actually out of the socket. It had come out. So the companions, they said to Qatada, Ya Qatada, let us just cut it out. You know, if you just keep it hanging like that, it's not good. Let us cut it. And he said, no, 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 I don't want to cut it. I will go to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he rubbed the eye and he put it back inside the socket and he could see perfectly clear. Later on in his life, Qatada, he said, Wallahi, I don't even remember. Was it my right eye or was it my left eye? Because it was so perfectly healed that he couldn't even, he didn't even know which eye it was. He said, was it my right eye or was it my left eye? I don't even remember. I don't even know which eye it was. That's how perfectly it healed. 
the angels as we mentioned they were fighting alongside the Muslims against the kuffar and the companions they 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 noticed some amazing things that happened because of the fighting of the angels they couldn't see the angels but they could see some of the effects of the fighting of the angels there was a companion by the name of Abu Dawood al-Harithi radiallahu an and he was about to strike the neck of one of the disbelievers with his sword he was about to strike the neck but before he could touch the guy's neck with his sword before he could even reach his neck the guy's neck just flew off his head flew off so he was like what is this what just happened here I didn't even hit him and his head comes off like that so when he told this to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Innama qatalahu malak. it was an angel actually who struck him and killed him such to the extent that the angels actually killed many of the kuffar the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after the battle was over and the dead bodies were lying all around he said to his companions he said do you want to know who you killed and who the angels killed do you want to know who are the casualties that were killed by you and who are the casualties that were killed by the angels? Do you want to know how to tell the difference? And the companion said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, go and see where they were struck on the necks and on the hands, wherever, wherever they were hit by the sword. Go and look at the place where they were cut. If you see the effects of being burned there as well, if you see the skin is burned where they were cut, then that means it was, it was an angel who did it. And if you see no burn marks, it means that one of you did it. And that is because the angels, they were fighting with swords of fire. Their swords were swords of fire. So when they would strike a person, the fire would also burn that person as well, along with the strike. So that is how they could tell who the angels killed and who the, the people killed. SubhanAllah. So, of course, the kuffar, they're suffering very, very heavy casualties. And the Muslims, mashallah, they're fighting very well and they're being very successful and victory is coming to them, alhamdulillah. But the leader of the kuffar, he's still alive. And that is Abu Jahl. And Abu Jahl has very, very heavy security around him as well, being the leader of the army. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf radiallahu an, he mentions that he was fighting and on his right side and on his left side, there were two young, very young people, maybe 15 or 16 year old. And you know, they didn't look very strong. They were, they were young, so they looked their age. They looked their age. So they were around 15 or 16 years old. One of them was Mu'adh ibn Amr ibn al-Jamuh. And the other one was Mu'adh ibn Afra. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he said, when I saw these two guys, one on my right and one on my left, I wished that there were some stronger people around me. So, you know, when I go, when I'm fighting, they could at least, you know, protect me. But these two weak looking guys, I, I didn't feel comfortable with them. So he said, while the fighting was going on, one of them whispered in his ear. One of them whispered in the ear of Abdurrahman ibn Auf. And he said, Ya Am, oh my uncle, Ata'arifu Aba Jahan? Do you know who is Abu Jahan? And Abdurrahman ibn Auf said, Yes, I know him, of course. Why do you want to know? And then this young, young boy, he said, سَمِعْتُ أَنَّهُ أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ عَدَاوَةً لِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ He said, I heard that he is the biggest enemy of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. And then Abdurrahman ibn Awf said, yes, that's true. And then he said, وَاللَّهِ لَإِنْ رَأَيْتُهُ لَأَقْتُلَنَّهُ وَاللَّهِ if I see him, I will kill him. And he said this secretly in his ear because he didn't want anyone else to hear and take his chance to kill Abu Jahl. He wanted that honor for himself. After a little while, the other boy on the other side, he whispered in his ear, Ya Am, can you tell me who is Abu Jahl? He said, Yeah, I know who he is. And when he comes, I'll show him to you. He said, Yes, I heard that he is the biggest enemy of Rasulullah. And if I see him, I want to kill him. So now, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he feels more comfortable. He says, SubhanAllah, these are, these are very brave, courageous young boys. Looks aren't everything. Even though they may look young and weak, they are, they are brave like lions. So now he felt comfortable with them fighting on his side. When Abu Jahl actually came near that area, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, he told both of these boys, the one you're looking for, Abu Jahl, that's him. He's right there. And Abu Jahl was there. And around him, there were so many kuffar of the Quraysh serving as his guards, as his security. Such to the extent that it's mentioned that it looked like Abu Jahl was in a forest. And all of those people around him like trees and Abu Jahl in the middle of the forest. 
But that didn't stop these two young boys. When they saw Abu Jahl, they, they, they ran as fast as they could. They're racing each other because each one wanted the honor of killing him for themselves. They didn't want to give the other one a chance. So they both ran as fast as they could and they were able to infiltrate that security. They were able to go through so fast. And they both jumped on Abu Jahl. And they both started striking him with their swords. Both of them hit him. And they were able to escape as well. They were able to go through all of that security, kill Abu Jahl and escape. That's how fast it happened. And it happened so suddenly that the kuffar, they didn't even realize what happened. And the Muslims, they were even surprised. What's going on here? What just happened here? So those two young boys, they went and they killed Abu Jahl. They killed the leader of the army of the Quraysh. And then they retreated. Later on, after the battle was over, the Prophet ﷺ asked, who killed Abu Jahl? Who is the one who killed Abu Jahl? So both of those boys, they said, I did it. Mu'adh ibn Amr ibn al-Jamuh, he said, I did. And Mu'adh ibn Afra, he said, I did. So the Prophet ﷺ said, okay, okay, bring your swords. Let me see your sword. So he looked at the swords of both of them and he said, both of you, both of you killed him. Both of you killed him. So that was the, the honor that went to both of those boys. Now the leader, the head of the army of the Quraysh, Abu Jahl, is dead. He's gone. So now the Kuffar army is in chaos. They don't know what to do. They have no leader anymore. So now it's time for them to retreat. They realize that this is over. Our leader is gone. Our, our strongest fighters are all dead there's nothing we can do now and they started to run away they started to bolt in the opposite direction instead of going face to face towards the Muslims they started running in the opposite direction now there was a man his name was Qubath ibn Ashyam and during the whole time while the fighting was going on he didn't want to fight so he was just sitting in the back behind the army of the Kuffar there was like a, a small hill like a mound and he was just sitting on top of it, just watching the fighting going on. He didn't want to fight himself. Now suddenly he sees the army of the Kuffar running back towards his direction. And he's surprised. And he says, Lam ara yawmi ajaban. I've never seen anything like this. Farru minhu kan nisa. They're running away from the battle like women. Are these even men or are they women? And they started running, running back. And he's surprised at this. Many years later, Qubath ibn Ashyam, he accepted Islam. And he went to Medina to find the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He asked, I, I need to see Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And they said, he's in the masjid. So Qubath, he went to the masjid and he met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to accept Islam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said to him, aren't you Qubath ibn Ashyam? And he said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. And then he said, tell me what you said on the day of Badr. And he said this only to himself. He didn't say it to anyone. When he saw them running, retreating like cowards, he said, Farru minhu kan nisa. They're running away like women. He just said it to himself and he never talked to anybody about it. But the Prophet wasallam said, Kayfa qulta yawma Badr, Ya Qubath. What did you say on the day of Badr, Ya Qubath? And he said, I didn't say anything. He said, didn't you say, Lam ara ajaban farru minhu kan nisa. Didn't you say that I've never seen anything like this? They're running away like women. And then Qubath said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka rasulullah. I swear, I bear witness that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah and that you are the messenger of Allah. There is no way that anyone could have known that. I said it to myself. I never even told my family about it. The only way you could have known that was by getting revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this battle of Badr that we talk about, that you hear about as the most decisive battle in the history of Islam, it only lasted about two or three hours, finished. Not days, not weeks, no, it lasted two to three hours and it was done. That is how decisive the victory was for the Muslims and for Al-Islam on that day. The Muslims, they killed 70 soldiers from the kuffar and they took 70 prisoners and from amongst those prisoners were al-abbas he was not killed but he was taken as a prisoner and also aqil ibn abi talib that's the brother of ali ibn abi talib and other prisoners as well now umayya ibn khalaf and remember umayya ibn khalaf he was one of the worst most barbaric kuffar of the Quraysh. he was the one who owned bilal in mecca 
and he tortured Bilal until Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu purchased him. So Umayyah was a big fat guy and he didn't even have an intention to go but he was taunted by Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyat. He said, look, you're not even going to go. You're, you're like a woman. That's why you're staying in Mecca. And because of his pride and his honor, he ended up going. So when everyone was running away from the battle, when they knew that Abu Jahl is dead, our leader is dead, this is over. And they started running away. Umayyah ibn Khalaf, he wanted to run away too, but he's very fat and he can't run very fast. So he knew that he would not be able to run. And he knew that the Muslims would eventually catch up to him and he would be killed. So instead of being killed, he offered himself as a prisoner. He saw Abdurrahman ibn Auf and he said to him, take me, you can take me as a prisoner. You can take me as a prisoner. And you know, the Quraysh, they will pay big money for me as a ransom. So just take me as a prisoner. He surrendered himself basically because he knew that he would not be able to run away. So Abdurrahman ibn Auf said, okay, I'm taking you as a prisoner. And he took him as a prisoner. And as he was taking him to the prisoner camp, they came across Bilal radiallahu anhu. And Bilal who was tortured by this man for so long, now he sees him again. And he says to Abdurrahman ibn Auf, leave him, I will kill him. And then Abdurrahman ibn Auf says, no, no, you can't kill him, he's my prisoner. He said, leave him, I will kill him. La najawtu in naja. Either he lives or I live. Either he lives or I live. I will kill him. You cannot let this, you cannot take this guy as a prisoner. He is one of the worst enemies of Islam. This type of person has to be killed. But Abdurrahman ibn Auf said, no, 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 you can't. He's my prisoner. So Bilal radiallahu an, he leaves and he sees some of the Ansar, some of the people of Medina sitting. And he says to them, you know, when I was in Mecca, I was tortured in such and such a way. And there was a man who did this to me and that to me. And then the Ansar, they're getting very angry. Like who dared, who did this to you? And then, then he said it was Umayyah ibn Khalaf. And he is with Abdurrahman ibn Auf right now. He has taken him as a prisoner. And then the Ansar, they have been rowled up. Bilal has told them all the whole story of what happened to him in Mecca. And they said, we will help you. We will go with you and we will all kill him together. So Bilal takes this group now of the Ansar and they go to Abdurrahman ibn Auf. And they say, let him go, release him, we're going to kill him. And Abdurrahman ibn Auf, he tries to stop them, but he's not able to do it. They jump on him, they ambush him, and they kill him. All of them together, they kill him. And that was the death of Umayyah ibn Khalaf. So the Muslim army, they were able to kill 70 of the kuffar, and they took 70 prisoners. And the Prophet ﷺ orders for the bodies, the dead bodies of these leaders of the Quraysh to be thrown into a well. They're not honorable enough to be buried, no. So he threw them, he ordered them to be thrown into the well. Abu Jahl and Utbah ibn Rabi'ah and Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, they're all thrown into the well. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he addresses those dead people and he says to them, هَلْ وَجَدْتُمْ مَا وَعَدَكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ حَقَّا فَإِنِّي وَجَدْتُ مَا وَعَدَنِي رَبِّي حَقَّا He says to these kuffar, these dead people, have you found the promise of your Lord to be true? Have you found out now that whatever Allah promised you, it is true? Do you realize it now? فَإِنِّي وَجَدْتُ مَا وَعَدَنِي رَبِّي حَقَّا Because surely I have seen that the promise of my Lord is true. And the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they see him addressing these dead bodies and they said, Ya Rasulullah, they're dead. Can they hear you? And he said to them, Wallahi, you are not hearing me better than they are hearing me. They can hear me just as good or better than you are hearing me. So this is how the Prophet ﷺ addressed these dead leaders of the Quraysh. On the way back to al Madina, on the way going back to al Madina. The Prophet ﷺ ordered for the prisoners to be brought in front of him. He said to his companions, bring the prisoners. There were 70 prisoners. From amongst those prisoners, the Prophet ﷺ ordered for Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt to be brought forward. So Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt is brought forward. And the Prophet ﷺ says to the Sahabi Asim ibn Thabit. He says, Ya Asim, uqtulhu. Qum waqtulhu. O Asim, execute him. Execute Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyat. Now Uqba, he's surprised. He wasn't expecting it. He said, why me? 
why me amongst all of these other prisoners? Why are you singling out me? Why, do, why, why are you going to execute me? And the Prophet ﷺ tells his companions, you know who this man is? Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyat. He is the man that when I used to make sujoods to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would put his hand on my, his, he would put his foot on my head. And he is the one who brought the intestines of a camel while I was in sujood and he put them on me. This is that man. Ya Asim, uqtulhu. So he told Asim ibn Thabit to, ki to kill him. So Asim, he executed Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayyat. Then he ordered for another Ibn al Harith, another prisoner to be brought forward. Another Ibn al Harith. And he told Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ya Ali, qum waqtulhu. Oh Ali, get up and execute him. And another, he's surprised, Why me? There are so many other prisoners. Why, why am I being singled out for this? And the Prophet ﷺ explains that this is the man that when the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, when he used to recite Quran, this man would come along and he would read his stories. He would make up stories. And he would say, why are you listening to Muhammad? I have stories just like he has stories. Listen to my stories. He would try to bring people away from, the, from listening to the Quran. And he would claim that the Quran is just stories. Whenever you see in the Quran, قَالُوا أَسَاطِيرُ الْأَوَّلِينَ That these are just stories of the past. People would say that the Quran is just fairy tales and stories from the past. This is another Ibn another Ibn al-Harith who used to make these statements. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered for him to be executed as well. So Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an executed him. So this is basically the battle of Badr. And all of this, it took place within just a few hours. SubhanAllah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a very decisive victory to the Muslims. Jibreel alayhi salam, later on, he asked the Prophet ﷺ, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, what do you think, what is... What is your opinion of the people of Badr, Ya Muhammad? And the Prophet wasallam said, The people who, who fought in Badr, they are the best from amongst us. And then Jibreel alayhi salam, he said, It is the same thing with the angels. The angels who fought in the battle of Badr, we consider them to be the best of the angels as well. Just like the people who fought in the battle of Badr are the best of the companions, the angels who fought in the battle of Badr are the best of the angels as well. So the battle of Badr and those companions who fought in the battle of Badr, they have a special significance over others, even amongst the companions themselves. Those 313 people, they have a special rank and they have a special status and position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is proven by the incident of one of the companions named Hatib ibn Abi Balta'ah. Hatib ibn Abi Balta'ah. He was one of the companions who fought in the battle of Badr. And years later, he actually gave some intelligence to the kuffar of Mecca. He gave the kuffar of Mecca some information about some of the plans of the Prophet ﷺ. This was not the right thing to do, of course. But he did it not out of kufr or out of nifaq, but he did it out of fear for his family. He thought that, okay, if I give them some information about the plans of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, maybe they will protect my family. Because he didn't have any protection in Mecca, this man. So he thought, okay, if I give them this information, they will keep my family safe. But the Prophet ﷺ was informed by revelation that this is what this man did and the letter was revealed before it could reach those people. So when it came out that Hatib did this, that he was actually going to send secret information to the kuffar of the Quraysh about the plans of the Prophet ﷺ, this is something very serious. So Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu an, you know he's very serious about these issues. He said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya, ya Rasulullah, give me permission to strike the neck of this munafiq. And the Prophet said, No, no, Ya Umar. No. Innahu shahida badran. Innahu shahida badran. Wa ma yudrika la alla allaha ittala'a ala ahli badrin faqal i'malu ma shi'tum faqad ghafartu lakum. Subhanallah. He said, No, Ya Umar, you can't do that. Because Hatib is one of the companions who was present at the battle of Badr. And how do you know? How do you know, Ya Umar? Maybe Allah has looked upon the people of Badr and He has said to them, Do whatever you want. Do whatever you want. For surely I have forgiven you. Subhanallah. Whatever they do, they are forgiven. So this is the status of the people who witnessed the battle of Badr.
And these are some of the events that took place on that great day. Inshallah, next week we will talk about the aftermath of the Battle of Badr and the return of the Prophet and the Muslims to Medina and the return of the Kuffar of the Quraysh to Mecca. Bi'ithmillah. Wallahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.